Hi everyone, in this video I want to cover something uh, very very important in finance which is this uh, distinction and relationship between a firm's unlevered beta and its uh, levered beta. So at some point in your study of corporate finance you will come across an equation which looks uh, like this where it says that a levered beta equals 1 plus b over s into a firm's unlevered beta so beta u stands for unlevered beta l stands for levered and b over s here stands for the firm's debt to equity ratio uh, in market value terms sometimes you may come across the same equation with a slightly different notation where instead of levered beta you see beta s beta s uh, basically stands for equity or stock beta so equity beta and uh, instead of un unlevered beta, you might see something like beta A, where beta A is basically acid, acid beta. Uh, the first thing that I want to tell you is that uh, unlevered beta and acid beta essentially mean the same thing. They're just two different ways of saying the exact same thing. And a firm's equity beta is also called its uh, levered beta. So again, they mean the exact same thing. Now, some of you may see the exact same set of equations, but maybe in this form, where you have more or less the same formula, but right here against B over S, you also have this expression of uh, 1 minus T, where T here basically stands for the corporate tax rate. Uh, and uh, again, you might say, well, maybe this formula needs to be used when there are taxes, and maybe this is the formula that you use when there aren't any taxes. It turns out that even in the presence of taxes, you can use either this equation or this equation. As to which one you should use depends on the context. And again, I'm not going to go over that in this video. The purpose of this video is first for you to fundamentally understand what it is that levered beta or equity beta is and what it is that an unlevered beta or the firm's asset beta is. And so for that reason, we're going to start out very simple. We're going to say, let's assume a world in which there is no debt and also a world in which there are no corporate taxes. So in such a world, imagine that there is a firm which has a bunch of assets. So what I'm going to do is draw a very, very simple uh, sort of a balance sheet where we know that on the left, the firm has a bunch of assets. Uh, if we are living in a world where there is no debt, then by definition, all of these assets are funded by equity. So for illustration purposes, let's assume that these are assets in a restaurant business. So imagine that there were a bunch of uh, people who put together all the equity and they said, okay, let's create a restaurant business. We're going to hire a manager and this manager is going to be overlooking uh, this restaurant business. We have provided the equity, and so there are tables and uh, chairs and all the raw material that the tomatoes and the potatoes and all of those that are being used to produce the dishes, which are then being sold to customers, you know, all that. At any given point in time, if somebody asks you, well, what are the cash flows that are being produced uh, by these assets or are expected to be produced by these assets, you'd say, well, financial cash flows or free cash flows are calculated as earnings uh, before interest and in taxes into one minus the tax rate plus depreciation minus any capital expenditures and minus any changes in net operating working capital or net working capital. So this is an indication of how much cash flow is being produced or is expected to be produced. And the reason why I'm using the word expected is because, well, cash flows that are produced by businesses tend to be risky, especially if you're in a restaurant business. Like, let's suppose that unemployment increases. Well, if unemployment increases, then that means that more people are not going to want to eat out, which means that it will have an impact on the cash flows that are going to be produced. Similarly, if inflation goes up, then again, the dishes are going to be more expensive and again it may limit the extent to which people are able to go out and eat out and so that will have a dampening effect on your financial cash flows they can go lower or the exact opposite can happen uh, inflation could be lower or unemployment could be lower and cash flows can be higher the point being 
that cash flows that are expected to be produced by these assets are risky. And depending on what kind of business it is, the cash flows from some assets are going to be more risky than others. What does that mean? Well, if this is a restaurant, then restaurants are very susceptible or very sensitive to inflation, to unemployment. But compare that to a business like, let's suppose, like Walmart, for example. Well, Walmart would have very different types of assets. And the thing is that even if unemployment goes up, even if inflation goes up, people still need to buy their very basic necessities. And so Walmart's cash flows might go down, but not by as much. And conversely also, if uh, inflation is lower or unemployment is lower, people may actually say, well, you know what? I get my basic stuff from Walmart, but now I'm richer or things are less expensive. I'm actually gonna go to Whole Foods and buy a lot of organic stuff. So the cash flows might not increase that much as well. My point being that depending on the nature of the business, some businesses will have cash flows that are more sensitive to macroeconomic shocks like inflation, unemployment, interest rates. And so that is what we mean by a firm's asset beta. Asset beta or the firm's unlevered beta is simply a representation of how sensitive a firm's cash flows are to market movements or macroeconomic shocks. In fact, it turns out that asset beta itself depends on two main things. One is called cyclicality of revenues. So cyclicality of revenues, the more cyclical a firm's revenues are, and by that I mean how they move with the cycles of the economy, the more cyclical they are, the higher is the asset beta. So for example, restaurants tend to have revenues that are very cyclical. What does that mean? If the economy is booming, then restaurant businesses tend to do well because, well, everybody's eating out. Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are eating out. And similarly, when the economy is receding, like what happened during COVID, well, not a lot of people are eating out. So your revenues are moving with the cycles of the economy and the more sensitive they are to the cycles of the economy, we say the more cyclical your revenues are. So generally restaurants and hospitality industry tend to have high asset beta because they have high cyclicality of revenues. There's another thing which influences asset beta, which is called a firm's operating leverage. So operating leverage basically refers to the extent to which your costs tend to be more fixed in relation to variables. So at a very high level, you can think of operating leverage as the ratio of your fixed costs in uh, relation to your variable costs. So if a business has a lot of fixed costs in relation to their variable costs, we say that they have high operating leverage. All else equal, the higher is the operating leverage, the higher is your asset beta or the more sensitive your cash flows are to market movements. Think about it. If a lot of your costs are fixed, this means that if the economy starts to go up so that a lot of people start showing up to your restaurant, if your costs are mostly fixed, that means that you will get a lot of revenue because your revenue will be going up, more people are eating out, but your costs are not going to increase that much, right? Because most of them are fixed. And so as a result, your cash flows will shoot up because revenues are increasing disproportionate to the costs at a very high level. But the converse is true as well. If the economy is receding, and again, you cannot decrease your costs because your costs are mostly fixed, then you have a substantial decrease in revenue. Your costs haven't decreased by as much. And as a result, your cash flows will go down quite a bit. So some businesses tend to have high operating leverage by their very nature. Think about airlines. They tend to have a lot of fixed costs because they have leased out their planes, for example. And so regardless of whether people are traveling or not traveling, they have to pay a lot of fixed costs in the form of lease payments that they're making, for example. This is just one example. The point is that there are certain businesses and therefore there are certain assets which by their very nature will have high cyclicality and by their very nature will have high operating leverage. It's the nature of the business. And so if somebody could see how movements in the market, 
like changes in inflation, changes in unemployment, and therefore changes in the stock market, say the S&P 500, are impacting these cash flows, then the sensitivity of these cash flows to those changes, that would essentially be asset beta. Now, you can probably see that there's a problem. If you wake up one day and you find out that the S&P 500 index has moved down because the news has just come out that unemployment is going to be higher than expected, well, you don't directly observe the impact that that movement in the S&P is having on the financial cash flows. I mean, you know going into the restaurant that the cash flows are going to be lower going forward because unemployment is expected to be higher, and that's why the S&P is down, but you don't directly observe that, right? So asset beta is not directly observable. Yes, we know it exists, but we cannot directly measure it. However, in an all equity firm, whom do these cash flows belong to? Exactly, they belong to the equity holders. So now here's what happens. Let's suppose that you're one of the equity holders who wakes up one day and finds out that you're holding the stock of this company and now you know that because the S&P has gone down, why? Because you've just heard the news that unemployment is going to be higher than expected. You're like, oh man, I am not going to be getting all these high cash flows that I initially thought I was going to get. What are you going to do? You're likely going to want to sell the stock, right? Because the now the worth of the stock that you're holding is now less. And so what's going to happen is that if I plot the X and the Y axis so that on the horizontal axis, I'm measuring movements in the S&P 500, which is reflective of what is happening in the market. So it's capturing the effects of all the macroeconomic shocks like unemployment, inflation, all of that. And over here, I'm plotting the returns that you are going to make on your equity. Then basically on the day that the S&P moves down, right? So on the day that the S&P has... Uh, some sort of like a negative uh, return here, right? Because there was some, so let's suppose it's negative 2% because, uh, because of the unemployment news, then the returns on your equity on that day is also going to go down, maybe over here. So let's suppose maybe it moves down by negative 1%. Now, how much it is going to move down by is going to be influenced by what? By the underlying asset beta. In other words, it is going to be influenced by what equity holders are expecting the impact to be on the underlying cash flows. If the business has a very high asset beta, then the revision downwards in financial cash flows is going to be much larger. And uh, maybe this impact will be as much as negative 3%. My point being, and this is the key, that all that asset beta, all that risk in the cash flows of the assets is ultimately being borne by the equity holders and the equity holders vis-a-vis -vis their trading activity will reflect that in the stock returns. So the converse will be true as well. If the S&P goes up because let's suppose the inflation is expected to be lower than what people thought, well, then more people will be eating out and you as an equity holder will benefit because the worth of your stock is going to go up and as a result, the returns on your equity are going to go up. And so if people started plotting the relationship between equity returns and stock returns, this relationship, the slope of this line is basically called equity beta. And some of you may have seen this also. Equity beta is basically measuring how sensitive your stock returns are to market movements or market returns. So the symbol that we use for that is equity beta or beta S. The main point here is this. If a firm is funded entirely with equity, there is no debt, then all the risk of the cash flows that is embedded in the assets vis-a-vis -vis the asset beta is being borne by the equity holders. And so in an all equity firm, levered beta or equity beta is going to be the same as unlevered beta. In other words, in an all equity firm, equity beta and asset beta are the same. Please understand, this is very, very important. We're not saying they're the same in the sense that they're the same thing. We're not saying that. They're two very different things. Asset beta is how sensitive the cash flows of the assets are to market movements. Equity beta is how sensitive the equity returns are to market movements. 
what we are saying is that in an all equity firms, the magnitude of the two numbers is going to be the same. If this is two, then this is two. Well, actually, if this is two, if asset beta is two, then equity beta is two. It goes from asset beta to equity beta. But they are two very different things. Asset beta is something that exists on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Equity beta is what exists on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Asset beta is something that we cannot measure directly, but equity beta is. Why? Because equity is traded. So we can plot equity returns against S&P 500 returns, and we can actually measure it vis-a-vis -vis the slope of this line. And in an all equity firm, we're saying that that equity beta is actually a representation of the underlying asset beta. So please understand that this is very, very important. And this will be key to your understanding of how the relationship between the two variable is. And this will be key to your understanding of how the two are related when we introduce debt into the picture. So what if the assets are now not only funded with equity, but also with debt? And then later on, what happens when there are corporate taxes? So that's something for a separate video. If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning.